The line between Jalo and Slasher has always been a thin one. While they both feature people being murdered, Jalos tend to involve a bit more mystery and investigation, usually by some determined detective. Though their main indicator may just be their Italian setting. If you want to see a great one, I highly recommend anything by Dario Argento. But what if I were to tell you that in 1987, the protege of the Jalo legend himself tried his hand at a full-blown slasher movie? Join us on today's Real Slashers. This is one that you've probably never heard of, and that's okay. That's honestly what we're hoping for. It doesn't help that it's gone by many different titles. Aquarius, Bloody Bird, or even its original Italian title, Deliria. But today, we're diving into the debut film of Dario Argento's protege, Michele Suavi, with 1987's Stage Fright. This show opens in just one week from now. And as you can see, those people up there literally stink. At this point, either you let me do things my way, or you can say goodbye to your... Yes, 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 the movie hails from Italy, and like most Italian cinema, all of the dialogue is done through ADR. That means all of these lines are looped, and there are plenty of instances where the lip sync is way off. I feel like I need to get that out of the way immediately, because it can be a tad distracting if you didn't know. I'm very sorry about this. The movie starts out on this beautiful blonde as she walks out of a building. She doesn't get far before getting pulled into an alleyway and killed. We get all of these insane reactions until the camera finally pulls out and we realize that this is all a stage play. This misdirect really sets up for what we're in store for because it's wholly unique and keeps this surreal feeling going. I want to thank you guys for watching Real Slashers and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. The play being performed is called The Black Owl, and it's supposed to be some erotic look at a serial killer. Yeah. The director, Peter, is obsessed with the level of eroticism needed to pull off this play. That's pretty much all that I can glean from this, because otherwise, it just seems like absolute chaos. This is when we get to the escape killer angle. Our lead, Alicia, that's the blonde earlier, she just doesn't have a wig on now, and her friend Betty decide they need to go to the hospital for assistance due to an injury. So they decide to go to the mental asylum because it's closest. Huh? Because you know, you can just roll up to a mental ward and have them look at your ankle. Try it sometime, they won't commit you or anything. A crazed mental patient sneaks into Betty's car and eventually murders her with a pickaxe. Her body is discovered a little later and the play is shut down. All the people go home and it's all a magical ending. Just kidding, the director is so gung-ho about getting his musical just right that he orders the main cast members to be locked in the building for the night. He's even changed the play to make the escaped killer, Irving Wallace, the new identity of the play's would-be killer. Only one problem. They're now trapped in there with the real Irving. What proceeds is a standard one-by-one -one killing, but it does so in a way that feels fresh. There's a ton of different characters here, and they each get taken out one after another in rapid succession. This film's purpose doesn't seem to make us feel for these people. It's more to witness some gnarly kills. By the time the grand finale happens, you're lost in a whirlwind of blood and feathers. We even get a little director cameo at one point as Michele shows up as a young cop. He even has a funny bit where he's comparing himself to James Dean and fixing his hair. It's a nice juxtaposition of the chaos going on inside, and those meant to protect completely oblivious on the outside. Even when it seems like Alicia has beaten Irving and sent him to a fiery grave, he returns and almost chops her up with an axe. Thankfully, Willie the security guard has Deadeye turned on and shoots him right between the eyes. And he's definitely not coming back from that, right? Oh, for fuck's sake. Listen to me. I think that maniac is hiding me. Are you gone out of your mind? 
Come on, kill her! Kill her! This movie really seemed prime for a good whodunit, doesn't it? But instead of causing us to suspect any of the actors, we're shown right away that this is just an escaped nutcase. His name is Irving Wallace, and he's the play's new inspiration. He used to be an actor who grew tired of his castmates and murdered them all. I never would have imagined that a killer with a giant owl head would be scary, but well, here you have it. This overly large owl head is downright terrifying given the circumstances. But with how bloodthirsty he is, it's kind of hard for him to not leave some kind of impact on you. He just will not stop murdering these people. And hey, it's not like owls aren't actual badasses in the bird kingdom. Plus, anyone that's read some Batman comics knows that the Court of Owls is nothing to mess with. So owls can hold their own. Clayne Parker starred as Irving, and while he has no real lines, he has quite the presence. He moves quick when he wants to, and there's a genuine menace behind his eyes. It's really too bad we didn't get to see him try his hand at this again, because he really stands out as a horror villain. The first few kills of the film, it almost seems like they're going to go the less is more route. Even this pickaxe to the head is bloodless. It sets up the audience expectation pretty early, but then things go completely insane out of nowhere, and it's absolutely glorious. Damn near every single person introduced in this film dies in a horrific way, only to be put on display at the end. It really cements how insane Irving Wallace is. There's this terrifying scene where Irving has killed Brett and taken his costume. On stage, the director, Peter, is yelling at him to complete the scene. Just stand there, grab her! Oh, Peter, you're going to regret that. Come on, kill her! Kill her! Shit has officially hit the fan. While he definitely switches up his weapon of destruction, there is a stretch where the man shows his love for a chainsaw. He absolutely annihilates people with it, dismembering everyone in sight. I know someone may be upset at the guy for gimmick infringement, but it's badass, so that should make up for it. I think you push the erotic angle about as far as you can. The erotic angle? You call that erotic? If you've ever been in theater, you'll know that one of the common elements is sexual tension. At least that always seems to be the case in movies. And the fact that everyone is sleeping with one another. That aspect is represented a little bit here, but only in passing moments. Suave isn't trying to be too exploitative with the nudity. One of the funnier aspects is when Laurel is getting undressed and we get to see just how fake her boobs are. <laughs> Damn. There's a little bit of nudity just after that, but it's in the midst of a stalking scene, so there's no sexiness to be had. <laughs> The key scene towards the end is just an absolute masterclass in tension. See, it's set up early that there are only two ways out, and both of them are locked with no key in sight. The first is lost when this lady is pickaxed, and the second is lost when this lady is murdered. This key is the only way for anyone to leave the building. With everyone dead, Alicia is trying to escape before the killer can get to her too. She's found a ring of keys and a gun, so she's positioned pretty well to do it. The camera cuts back and forth between her and the keys that she's so desperately trying to insert into the door. As she fumbles through them, she notices the killer takes a seat on stage, which is now decorated in the bodies of her dead friends. He and Michael would be very good friends. As she stares up at him as he sits on the stage enjoying his work, she notices the key at his feet. That's her ticket out. And Alicia's got some balls because she goes under the stage to try and pry it out. As she's positioned under the key, she pokes at it, trying to wiggle it free. The tension here while you just wait for Irving to notice poor Alicia is off the charts. Tension building on top of tension building. But then the key falls, just as the music stops and the jig is up. And I'm not sure what Alicia did to this cat, but he clearly has a vendetta against her because he points Irving right at her. When the owl finally finds her, the rock and roll music starts blaring and we get this amazing chase sequence as he comes after her with an axe. She ends up on the catwalk with nowhere else to go. 
As he slowly approaches her, you just know it is all over. I don't know when to show you how to put a bullet in the chamber. See that? I got him right between the eyes. Just like I said. Right between the eyes. Stage Fright opened in Italy on August 21st, 1987. It finally came to the United States on video in October 1989. This may just be the most unknown of all the slasher films we've talked about on this show, which is really too bad because it is expertly crafted, with some of the more interesting story developments for a slasher. Suave would go on to direct greats such as The Church and Cemetery Man, where he further honed his more artistic style. One of Suave's frequent collaborators and producer on this film, Joe D'Amato, had wished to remake this movie. Unfortunately, he was never able to get enough momentum behind the project before his unfortunate passing in 1999. While there was a film made named Stage Fright in 2014 that starred Minnie Driver, the only thing in common it has with Suave's film is that it involves a killer terrorizing a musical production. If it were to ever happen, you'd think it'd have happened during the glee craze of the late Audis, but it's always just managed to slip under the radar. Blue Underground released a fantastic Blu-ray of the film in 2016 where they fully remastered it from an uncensored negative. It features several interviews with the cast and crew. This release was recently one up by Shameless Screen Entertainment, who released the film with a brand new 4K restoration. But unfortunately for us North Americans, it's only available in the UK. I genuinely hope this video serves as a call to action to get more people to see this hidden gem. Because whether it's the dreamlike cinematography, rocking music, or the killer owl at the forefront, there's plenty to like about this hidden gem.